Halo 3's The Covenant may be one of the series' longest levels, but it's also undoubtedly one of its best, packing its runtime full of nearly everything which has helped make Halo such a beloved franchise. And with that being the case, I want to take a closer look at the mission and examine in more detail the design choices Bungie made which resulted in The Covenant becoming one of Halo's most iconic levels. If you enjoy the video, do consider subscribing, letting me know your thoughts and all that other good stuff. And now, let's begin things with a very familiar scene. The Covenant opens with pelicans approaching an island as an arrangement of Halo's themes swells in the background. It's clearly an homage to Halo Combat Evolved Silent Cartographer, which is no bad thing. It remains one of the series' most impactful missions to this day. And it's a premise which proved so popular, Bungie even used it a third time three years later at the start of Halo Reach's Long Night of Solace. As players take control of Master Chief at the start of the mission, they're greeted by what is probably the best designed beach scene in the entire franchise. The Silent Cartographer was very clever in that it grouped most of its enemies and cover in the middle of the beach, keeping combat intense despite the fairly large arena by funneling players through its middle. And this is something the Covenant does well too, placing most if not all of the action directly ahead of players, which combined with the rousing soundtrack encourages them to run headlong into battle. It also steps things up in terms of scale from the Silent Cartographer, which is something Long Night of Solace later borrows as well. There's a battle taking place in the skies above, which does much to add a sense of scale, and helps make what is actually a narrow, very linear gameplay section feel far more expansive than it has any right to. And, unlike either of the other levels mentioned, it also features turrets and a single enemy vehicle to mix things up. What the Covenant also does that neither the Silent Cartographer before it or Long Night of Solace after it manage to replicate is to feature at least somewhat varied terrain. Sure, players are still funneled down the middle of the beach through clever enemy placement, but it also features a touch more verticality and perhaps most importantly, a second route down the area's right hand side which is extremely easy to miss. The main path straight through the middle of the beach is the one I'd guess 90% of players took, but the particularly observant are rewarded with an alternate route offering a fantastic vantage point for destroying the two enemy turrets. Bungie, however, doesn't make it too difficult for players who choose the more obvious path either, and uses fantastic level design to create a buffer area between players and the turrets, devoid of any cover or enemies, which nudges them towards using the Spartan laser they begin the level equipped with. And this is so important because this mission is the first time players use the Spartan laser. Essentially, the turrets are there to give players the opportunity to quickly test out the weapon and immediately understand what its strengths are, namely destroying enemy turrets, vehicles, and sometimes even more powerful powerful enemies, and the two paths are designed so that whichever route they choose, they're able to do that from relative safety. The side path leaves them undetected, giving them the time they need to line up their shot, and the main path uses the buffer zone to encourage them to use the laser to take out the turrets before they cross to the other side. It's a wonderful way of presenting a learning opportunity to players in a space which is not necessarily designed with that as its primary purpose, like tutorial areas so often are. It's an easy thing to miss, but hats off to Bungie for creating such a subtle teaching moment. As the beach scene concludes, a pelican arrives and drops off a warthog, another callback to the silent cartographer, and much like in that mission, it's dropped facing the direction players should head next. It's hardly revolutionary game design, but it's a nice example of the little things developers can do to make players' lives that little bit easier. The vehicle section which follows is a classic example of Bungie's ability to expertly control the pacing in Halo games through the way it uses a mission's environments. What you'll nearly always experience in one form or another in every Halo level is multiple shifts between narrow and wide environments. The beach was narrow and relatively claustrophobic, and players then move into an area which is still fairly narrow, but does feel more open. Soon after that, they transition into what is perhaps the most open environment featured in the level up to that point, and when the battle there has concluded, they move back into a much more narrow set of hallways. From the beach onwards, the level increases in scope, and when Bungie decides it's opened up enough, things are scaled back down for a narrower indoor section. It's classic Halo level design, which ensures every mission feels fresh and engaging throughout. Next time you're playing through a Halo game, pay attention to the level design in each mission, and I almost guarantee you'll notice the same narrow to wide design philosophy being used all over the place. There's nothing much to note during this next indoor section, which features quite bog-standard encounter design, but it is worth taking note of this brute-filled hallway, as I'll be coming back to that a little later on. And speaking of coming back to something, the backtracking soon after this indoor section is also a strange choice by Bungie, given it does slow the tempo a little too much after such an eventful opening few minutes. 
but that change of pace to something a little slower doesn't last very long at all, with players soon after experiencing their second first time of the level. The Spartan Laser made its debut at the start of the Covenant, and this time it's the turn of the Hornet to make its grand entrance into the series. The fact Bungie introduces both during this level, despite the trilogy almost reaching its conclusion, demonstrates just how important they believe this mission to be. Indeed, Bungie stated that they considered the level to be the Covenant's last stand, and therefore particularly worthy of pulling out all the stops for. And speaking of all the stops, that extends to the rest of the Covenant as well. Players have the opportunity to use nearly every weapon featured in the game, and most of its vehicles. They get to fight alongside Marines, Elites, and even the Flood. And last but not least, there's a particularly grand set piece we'll get to in just a second. There are plenty of games which continue to throw everything in the kitchen sink at players in their latter stages, and often that doesn't end up working particularly well, so it really is testament to the strength of Halo 3's gameplay and mechanics that Bungie were able to introduce nearly everything the game has to offer in one mission, without it ever feeling forced, or like there's too much going on. As the trilogy draws near to its conclusion, it's a fitting display of Bungie's mastery of the genre developed over the six years since Halo Combat Evolve's release. After finding themselves back on solid ground, players eventually find themselves in an area filled with brutes, similar to the area I mentioned earlier, except this time Bungie throws in a twist as the flood arrive and the brutes which had not long ago been dispatched are soon turned. It's a great way of taking two areas that would otherwise be relatively mundane and using them to toy with players' expectations. The first builds a sense of familiarity, and the second uses the flood to turn that on its head. Fittingly, for a mission with such a high bar for quality throughout, even the Flood are handled really well. The Covenant features short, sharp bursts of Halo's iconic space zombies, which I think is exactly how they should be handled. They're featured in this section, they're featured at the end of the mission, which I'll get to shortly, and that's it. Used in this manner, there's no time for their signature move of run directly at players to get boring, and they actually add variety contrasted against the more tactical assaults by the Covenant. It stands in stark contrast to Cortana, the mission the Covenant precedes, which features only the Flood, and to be blunt, is certainly not the best Halo has to offer. Moving on, if the beginning of the Covenant felt like it was pulled straight from Combat Evolve's silent cartographer, then the next segment featuring a scorpion in the snow feels very much like reliving Assault on the Control Room. In fact, for players who are fans of Combat Evolved in particular, there are a ton of opportunities to relive some of its most iconic moments throughout Halo 3, the good, and on one occasion the bad. There's the beach and tank sequences in the Covenant I've already mentioned, the Warthog escape sequence in Halo is clearly inspired by the Moor, and even Cortana feels like a sequel to the library although that's probably not a good thing. As mentioned earlier, the Covenant packs in almost everything which makes Halo great, and the allusion to classic missions cements its status as a real love letter to the series as a whole. Everything I've just mentioned is fantastic, but the fight with the two scarabs which follows is a bit of a misstep. The level design leading up to it is exemplary. Players traverse a narrow area within a huge space before things open up in classic Halo fashion. And in terms of both tone and scale, this set piece is spectacular. But the Scarabs themselves disappoint. Now granted, only featuring one Scarab would hardly have been the most exciting thing in the world, given that players had already taken one down earlier in Halo 3. But using two does not work brilliantly, primarily because they both stand still in one place and do little more than turn to face whichever direction players are in when they choose to attack. Presumably, the 360 didn't have enough horsepower for them to move around much more than that, while also having to deal with an expansive environment and enemy and ally AI, but Bungie really don't help themselves. Why they would choose to draw attention to the fact that the Scarabs are near stationary by having both land on very obvious patches of dark ground, which they then stay on for the duration of the battle, is beyond me, but simply having that ground be snow-covered would at least go some way to masking how little the Scarabs actually move. But regardless of these issues, what the Scarabs do manage is to make the player feel like this really is the Covenant's last stand, so in that respect at least they absolutely manage to do what was required of them. What I would consider to actually be the true climax of the Covenant comes shortly after. The final section begins with what is a fairly long cutscene for one occurring mid-level in a Halo game, but the Covenant definitely gets away with it. Firstly, because of this being the Covenant's curtain call, but secondly, and perhaps more so, because it helps add extra weight to what comes next. As hopeful music swells in the background, players aren't joined by Marines or Elites, but rather, the Flood. And as players charge forwards towards the few remaining members of the Covenant alongside their newfound allies, the Covenant does something completely unique to any Halo game before or since. For the briefest of moments, players get to feel what it's like to be part of the Flood. This is a brilliant decision on Bungie's part. 
Not only is it an incredibly memorable way to end one of Halo's most memorable levels, it also serves a secondary purpose. Once the Covenant has concluded, the only enemy left for players to tackle is the Flood, and so it makes perfect sense to give players the opportunity to see things through their eyes, to give them a better understanding of what it's like being on the other side. It makes the Flood seem like an even more imposing threat as players experience firsthand how quickly they are able to overwhelm the Covenant, which works especially well when combined with the area this takes place in, one featuring narrow bridges packed full of enemies and allies, which makes players, and by extension the Flood's assaults, seem all the more relentless as a result. And then of course, once the Prophet of Truth has been dealt with and the Flood inevitably turn their attention back towards players, they come to the startling realisation. They now have to make their way back through the hordes of Flood they so recently fought alongside. It's one of those classic oh shit moments that the Floods so often provide. The classic Flood theme used since Halo Combat Evolved kicks in, and players fight the Covenant's final battle before meeting up with Guilty Spark and concluding the mission and what a mission the Covenant is. Looking at it story-wise from a very high level, it's one of the most important in the trilogy, and the way it's designed from start to finish does so much to make it feel climactic. It's not just in the way the level is designed, the variety of allies, enemies, weapons and vehicles used, or even the brief opportunity to fight alongside the Flood. It's because this level feels like Bungie took everything brilliant about Halo and packed it into one tightly paced and expertly constructed experience. Players may still have two more levels to battle through in Halo 3 after the Covenant concludes, both in my view of questionable quality, but for me, the Covenant will always be the level that helped ensure the Halo trilogy finished in truly spectacular fashion. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch the video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do consider hitting the big circle button on screen now to subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you all again soon.